Uh, I am Donna Jetson, the president of the Community Health Nurses of Canada. I'm calling in from Vancouver today, and I'm very grateful to be working on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, tsleil Tooth, and Squamish people. If there are other people on the call and you wish to acknowledge the traditional territory upon which you are calling in today for this learning session, please feel free to enter it into the chat. I want to welcome everyone to this inaugural webinar. The purpose of the webinars is to advance community health nursing practice in Canada, provide an opportunity for all of us to network, being that the National Conference for CHNC has been postponed the last couple of years, but we're gearing up for June 2022. We want to increase the profile of the innovative evidence-based adaptable work that we know community health nurses are doing across Canada during this robust and enduring pandemic and also provide a lead up to our national conference, which is uh, in a matter of weeks from now. Um, there will be time on the session today for everyone to ask questions. Anthony Lombardo is our executive director of CHNC and the, this session today will be recorded and posted on YouTube and closed captions will be available uh, for, the, uh, for the taping if uh, your colleagues are unable to attend. Uh, if, as we go, if you want to post questions in the chat box, uh, we'll come back to those, uh, uh, those questions. And I also wanted to put a quick plug in for the National CHNC Conference. We are still continuing to accept contract, uh, abstract, sorry, until March 4th of 2022. So if any of you have some ideas and would love to submit an abstract, we would love to have it. And by the way, there are 160 people that are registered for this session today. So with that said, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Elia Dosani, who was the 2021 Award of Merit recipient for the Community Health Nurses of Canada. Elia also served on our board of directors for the province of Alberta. Uh, Elia Dosani is a registered nurse, has a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, or a Bachelor of Nursing, sorry, Elia. Uh, an MPH and a PhD. Uh, Elia is a professor in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the Faculty of Health, Community and Education at Mount Royal University in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. She is also an adjunct associate pr professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the Cummings School of Medicine, also at the University of Calgary. She holds a PhD from the Department of Community Health Sciences at U of C with a specialization in population and public health. She has taught 17 different courses across four nursing programs and teaches a course titled Citizenship Without Borders in the Department of General Education. Dr. Dosani has led a multidisciplinary field school to Tanzania for six weeks with 18 students in 2010. She serves as a research preceptor and thesis supervisor for the Bachelor of Health Sciences program and also the master's program in population public health stream uh, in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the Cummings School of Medicine. She received the Distinguished Faculty Award in 2019 and was profiled in the Every Student Deserves a Great Prof Media campaign in 2020. That wasn't that long ago. Her work takes the social justice and equity lens to focus on maternal, newborn, and child health. Her research interests include working with at-risk populations through community-based programs and interventions. Dr. Dosani shares a passion for global health issues and works with research partners in many countries, including Tanzania, Kenya, Pakistan, and India to promote health equity. She has received over 1.1 million in research funding, both individually and as part of research teams. She is lead editor of the Community Health Nursing, uh, a Canadian perspective uh, journal. 
She has previously served on the Community Health Nurses of Canada Standards of Practice Advisory Committee and as Vice Chair of our Standards and Competency Standing Committee. Dr. Dosani served as National Child Health Lead for the Aga Khan Health Board of Canada from 2016 to 2019, serving a population of 70,000 individuals. Within this role, Dr. Dosani co-led the development of Baby to Be, a maternal mental health program that has been shared widely across six provinces in this country and with communities in Australia. Dr. Dosani has now, uh, sorry, Dr. Dosani currently serves as part of the Witness Editorial Board Advisory Collective, the first Canadian journal on critical nursing discourse. It is my pleasure to introduce Alia Dosani. Thank you so much, Donna. I appreciate the platform that the Community Health Nurses of Canada has offered. Um, today for me to share some of my work in terms of how do we highlight inequities that present um, as part of the ongoing pandemic. I wanted to acknowledge that um, you know all of the people who've made time to join today I appreciate. I see we have more than 90 people joining the call today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk about this important topic. So uh, I've titled my talk, COVID-19 and Inequities, Amplifying Community Health Nursing Impact Through Social Justice Approaches. And the way that I've set this discussion up today is I really like, I would, I would really like for us to talk about definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. I will highlight racism as a contributor to health inequity. We'll talk briefly about racism and health outcomes in the Canadian context and how this has, has been amplified through the um, context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we'll talk a little bit about what it is we as community health nurses can do from our social justice lens to make sure our interventions are responding to the challenges of inequity and how does that align with our community health nursing standards of practice. So I would love for us to get started um, with some definitions. And again, um, definitions are just a, a place for us to get started. Sorry, I forgot to advance my slides here. I'll give it a minute so you could read through this um, and then we'll get going. So the definition of health inequity, what is the difference? Um, basically what I'd like for us to recognize is that health disparities are more than just variations or differences that we're seeing in health and a social inequity in health, right? So basically health disparities are systemic, they're plausibly avoidable, they're health differences according to race, ethnicity, skin color, religion or nationality. Sometimes it's socioeconomic resources or positioning that's reflected by our income category, our level of wealth, our educational status or our occupation. Oftentimes we see this in regards to gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, geography, disability, illness, basically any, ca any category that we can, any category, sorry, that we can strategize um, or stratify against that causes discrimination or marginalization. The categories that I presented uh, just now reflect social advantage or disadvantage. And these uh, characteristics tend to determine an individual or group's position in a social hierarchy. Um, one of the uh, big pieces that I wanted for us to focus on is the distinguishing features of health inequity. And there are three of them. And the first is the differences we see are systematic. And basically this is when we see a consistent pattern across the population. And one of the most striking examples that we've seen in history is the differences in health between socioeconomic groups. The second is the differences that we're seeing are socially produced. And I wanna emphasize here that this is definitely not biologically produced and therefore modifiable. And also the third, the differences that we see are unfair. So basically um, how we frame disparities is that they're related to unjust social arrangements and this leads us to human rights arguments. In short, health inequities that we see are differences that are avoidable, they're unnecessary, they're unfair, and therefore they're unjust. Just 
just want to move forward here. Um, another key thing that we need to keep in mind is that health disparities are not the same as other differences that we're seeing. Disparities are those that are specifically health differences that adversely affect socially disadvantaged groups. Um, an example of this uh, could be a health difference from the perspective of the health status of elderly populations compared to young adults is not necessarily seen as a disparity. Okay, a higher rate of arm injuries against um, people who don't necessarily play professional sports, for example, tennis players, that is seen as a difference and not necessarily a disparity. Okay, if you're seeing um, higher rates of disease, particularly when you're comparing uh, millionaires with those who are along the same categories of socially advantaged with respect to income, that's not a disparity, or sorry, that's, yeah, that's not a disparity, that's a difference. And it's also important for us to recognize that although many health differences are important for a society to address, they may not necessarily be seen as health disparities. And sometimes even though these health differences merit attention, um, they may have other reasons that are relevant for health, but they're not the reason for it being a disparity or an inequity. So basically when we're talking about socially disadvantaged groups, we're talking about groups that, um, we're talking about their relative social positioning in, in respect to others in a social pecking order. Um, and so how do, we stratify, how do we stratify or how are different groups of people stratified differently based on the, the availability of the economic resources that they have, or as well by race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or differing levels of ability. And so basically, um, a lot of these characteristics define how people are treated in a society and how they're treated in society um, shows up differently in terms of health outcomes. This brings us to the next question, which is what is the root cause of disparities? So according to the Social Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, um, the basic root cause of health inequity lie in unequal distribution of power, of money, and of resources. And I really would like for you to keep that in the back of your minds. Um, and sometimes it's the bias and discrimination that lead to the differences in access to um, different levels of resources and the opportunities for health between different social groups. And that is seen as being unfair. So the question that um, the World Health Organization raised initially in 1946 was that of health being a human right. And that's that everybody has the right to enjoy the highest attainable standard of health in their society. And shouldn't that be the case in all societies moving forward? How do we see disparities being played out? Um, a big way for us to, um, I think, frame our thinking lies in the cycle of oppression that was published by uh, colleagues Josephine Etowa, um, Elizabeth McGiven, and their colleague McPherson. And this was published a long time ago, but I think it still rings true for today. And basically how it starts with is biased information. And if you're working from a perspective of having biased information, what you're actually doing is you're holding a stigma. When you turn that biased information into generalizations, what you're doing is you're stereotyping, okay? You're holding stereotypes. When you're internalizing these stereotypes and they actually become your beliefs, what you're doing is you're holding a prejudice. And when your prejudice translates into actions, what you're doing is you're engaging in discrimination. And basically the way that we categorize using your power to disempower, to marginalize and to silence others is, is oppressing, okay? So this is how the cycle of oppression continues. And we can see the cycle of oppression playing out at different levels in society. We see it at the individual level. We also see it at the community or group level. And we definitely see it at the population level. And I do want us for I do want for us to break this apart differently as we move forward in the in the in, in the conversation today. 
But before we get to that, I do want um, a consideration of the definition of social justice. And the Canadian Nurses Association defines social justice as the fair distribution of society's benefits, their responsibilities, and really importantly, their consequences. And we, what we want to do when we're focusing on social justice interventions um, is basically a laying our eye on the relative social position of one group in relationship to another. And when we're identifying the root causes of the disparities in relation to the social determinants of health, that's when we identify what it is we can do to eliminate this disparity. Now, my mentor, um, Ardeen Bowman, um, talks about this in her recent uh, community health nursing textbook and how she defines it is it counters oppression and powerlessness and it's based on the application of equity rights access and participation and I really would like for us to position these terms within that cycle of oppression that we've talked about so that we can learn to identify where it is we break those ties in that cycle of oppression and where it is we want to focus our attention as community health nurses on what we do, right? How do we, how do we put something into tangible action in terms of our social nurse or social justice interventions? I often show the next slide to um, my students because I think it helps uh, internalize the differences between some of the terms. So if you look at the first picture, you've got three individuals and they both have access to one block to stand on to see over the fence. This is equality. Okay. The second picture is equity, where you see the boxes being distributed in a way that enables everybody to see over the fence. So this is what we term equity, when resources are divided according to need. And in the third picture over here, you see a different type of fence. The wooden fence is completely removed, and this is what we term justice. So I like, I like showing this picture because it really helps for you to um, quantify or, or simply explain the differences between the terms. And what we're gearing for as community health nurses is this third picture right here. The justice is what we're leaning towards and what we're hoping for. Now, as I was preparing for this presentation, I wasn't sure how it was going to spin. Um, but when I came across this article by Nicole and colleagues that was recently published in 2018, um, what they found was that there are two main societal level constructs that contribute to inequity in the Canadian context. And those are income inequality and structural racism, which I found to be really, really powerful. Um, the 2017 Commonwealth Fund released a report evaluating 11 countries, so these are resource poor countries healthcare systems, on a variety of different domain, domains, and one of these domains was health equity. And interestingly enough, um, Canada, Canada's place on this scorecard was among the bottom three. And so that came as a little bit of a surprise to me, um, but even more surprising that Nicole and colleagues directly um, uh, pointed out structural racism as one of the contributing factors. And so what I'd like to do in my talk today is focus specifically on the structural racism issue that we have um, in the Canadian context. So here we have, again, a fairly new definition of racism. Uh, and I really like this definition, which is why I wanted to bring it forward. Uh, Sherman Cooper defined racism as a phenomenon whereby people of certain races become racialized through systematic differential treatment, differential access to resources, and differential access to oppor opportunities, which accumulates across the life course. Um, and so I've highlighted this word racialized because it's a term that I'm going to be using quite frequently for the remainder of the presentation. And it's a term that I think we need to understand and be on the same page uh, with. So somebody becomes racialized when they are treated differently or have different access to resources in a systematic way. So a lot of the people of color that you see, a lot of indigenous people, um, black people, for example, 
may have individual stories about how they feel they've been treated differently. But over time, if you collect all of these stories in a collective way, you will see that BIPOC people or, or, or people um, who are visible minorities are actually treated differently in a systematic way. And this is what we're seeing contributes to a big portion of the health inequity that we see at both individual community and population levels in the Canadian context. Nicole et al. also put together a really interesting framework that helps us understand the pathways to how inequities present themselves in, in health across the population and as well at the individual level. So you see on the, on the left, right, you've got economic and political contexts. All of these have an impact on how people are treated in terms of the policies that we see. Um, if you look at socioeconomic position, what they've chosen to do is place uh, social class, gender, and ethnicity within this pocket. Um, some may argue that it's a separate pocket altogether, but you can understand how, over time, um, people who are visible minorities or racialized may actually be placed in a, socio a, a, sorry, a lower socioeconomic position when you're comparing classes. That, of course, will lead to um, inequities that you see in material circumstances, including living and working conditions, the availability of food, how people may um, be perceived to behave, and certainly psychosocial factors. The intersection of all of this with the health system and how people may be treated systematically differently are what leads to the impact on inequity and well-being that we see with different population groups. Now, one of the articles that I thought was, was really interesting was, was this one by Hyman, and you can get um, the, full, the full citation in the reference list at the end, but basically Hyman points out four dimensions in which we can categorize racism and health outcomes in the Canadian context. The first is racial and ethnic inequities in health status, um, access to healthcare and quality of healthcare received within the Canadian context, and this is now widely known and accepted. Um, we also know that racism directly impacts health primarily through the body's physiological stress response. And so by this nature, um, some may argue that racialized people are more susceptible to illness, and we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit differently um, and deeper moving forward. The third is race, racism indirectly impacts on health to differential exposures and opportunities related to, to other social determinants of health. And this is where I'd like to quantify the intersectionality pieces of it. And then of course the fourth is institutional policies and practices which perpetuate racial and ethnic inequities and impede access to and quality of healthcare. So I thought it would be really interesting um, to see if I could find some recent literature that would help me make the case or help me sell to you basically that these four categories are which um, define inequities in healthcare that we're seeing in Canada. And so that's what I would like for us to, to focus on next. What's the evidence that we have available to us? And what we know when we compare the Canadian context of the evidence on racism and health inequity is that there are major gaps. Even when you look at the quality of evidence that's being produced by our neighbors in the South, the United States, there's much more work being done in their context than there is in ours. And even though um, the work is just beginning to gain momentum in the Canadian context, we still have a long way to go in terms of identifying the exact nature of the inequities and how this plays out in terms of health outcomes at the population levels, okay? So here are a few examples that I thought I'd like to bring forward. Um, Veenstra in 2009 indicated that there were significant inequities in diabetes. So South Asian or Indigenous populations had um, very big um, discrepancies or disparities in diabetes. So if you look at South Asian or Indigenous, um, they're three times more likely to have diabetes. And this is even after, for, after they were controlled for age, gender, and immigration status. They did a, a similar study with hypertension 10 years later 
and they're finding still significant results in terms of disparities, where you're seeing that Black respondents were significant, significantly more likely, almost um, two times more likely than white respondents to have reported hypertension. And so the question that comes to my mind is you've got the same author doing similar studies um, across the decade, and we're still seeing disparities that were pretty significant here. The question that comes to my mind is over these 10 years, how come we haven't seen changes, right? So these are all risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, and what's happening in our translation of knowledge that there's gaps in terms of what our interventions might be for racialized populations. Another example um, is we have a very high incidence of HIV infections occurring among our indigenous populations. And what's striking to me is that Indigenous populations piece of the pie of new incidents is about 14%, when in fact they only represent 4.9% of the, of the total Canadian population. So why is it that they have a higher rate of incidence? What type of a disparity is this population group experiencing to have a big difference, right? So to represent 14% of new incidents, while they only represent almost 5% of the total population. These are the types of questions that we need to be asking when we take a health equity lens, considering the definitions that were presented at the start of the, at the presentation. Okay. Um, even more striking to me is how people are treated within the healthcare system, right? So sure, we might be seeing these healthcare inequities, but when people are when people are able to voice that they feel they're being treated badly or treated differently, um, that should be a, a a big cue to us that something needs to change within our healthcare system. So if you look at the last example, black can black Canadians were almost twice as likely as white Canadians to report that they were treated badly or with less respect in the Canadian healthcare system after controlling for age, gender, immigration status, income, and education. So after all of this is controlled for, we still have our black, um, we still have black people in, in the Canadian context being more likely to be treated badly. And to me, that's, that's really not okay. Okay, so here are just a few examples of the inequities that we're seeing in the Canadian context with respect to health outcomes and racialized people. And if that's not enough for you, how about this? How about Indigenous genocide that we're just beginning to uncover? Death is a very clear health outcome to me. Very clear, right? And so this is something that should raise our spidey senses as community health nurses to pay more attention to what is happening to different people um, who may identify as racialized or be racialized within the healthcare system. And we really need to do a better job of addressing the inequities that we're seeing, okay? So the health outcomes are outcomes that we see at the population level. How do we see this playing out at the individual level? Mahabir and colleagues um, in their recent publication outlined um, very concrete examples of how we see this playing out. And I'm not saying that this is an uh, inclusive list, all inclusive list, but here are some examples, okay? The categories that they identified in their one study, and keep in mind, this is just one study, is people are dehumanizing, okay? So examples of dehumanizing the patient include um, when healthcare professionals are disrespectful, when they are bel belittling their clients or talking down to their clients or patients. Um, another one that we see often is when healthcare professionals do not show empathy or sympathy and they're impatient with people of color. Um, another Example of dehumanizing is when healthcare professionals do not listen or pretend they didn't listen or hear the client. The second category is negligent communication. And so this is when concerns about the plan of care are not considered. So these are the patient's concerns or the family's concerns, or they're, they're ignored or willfully misunderstood or misrepresented. 
Um, I've definitely had this happen to me as, as somebody seeking healthcare. I've actually had a healthcare provider lie to me, even after disclosing I was a registered nurse. Um, another example that we see often is healthcare providers place uh, a racialized client on hold on the phone and then proceeds to disconnect the call. All of these are examples of everyday racism that we see on the one-to-one -one level of interaction with the individual patient. The third category here is unequal access to health and health services. Um, and examples of, the, of these could be when there's little or no, no access to language interpreters, uh, when the patient cannot get access to government funded assistance programs, and when healthcare professional tells the client that they cannot keep them as a client because they already have a full roster. So what would be interesting for me to see is of all of the people who do not have a family doctor in Canada, what proportion of them are racialized? And I bet you it would be a big chunk of the pie there. We also see uh, racialized people uh, being treated differently in terms of professional misconduct. Examples of these being they're often discharged prematurely from, from the hospital. Um, they're not being treated for their pain or not believed when they are voicing that they have pain. And of course, not relaying messages to other service providers or referring them appropriately to specialists. Um, another thing that we've seen, um, and again, I've experienced this, is not having health assessments being completed appropriately. The last category Mahabir and colleagues um, point out is racial and ethnic and class discrimination. Um, so basically we see this when a particular healthcare professional is talking to the client or their family in ways that um, make them believe they're uneducated. Victim blaming is huge. We often see people of color and racialized people being labeled as drug seekers um, and being differently based on their appearance. And also when healthcare providers might not be familiar with cultural or religious practices. And um, I really would like for us to reflect on whether or not we as healthcare professionals have ever been engaged in this sort of behavior and um, encourage or um, hold spaces for reflective practice where we can figure out whether or not we've contributed to individual racism and draw the links between how we see this play out in health outcomes at the population level. Other examples um, of this are when we see racialized people um, not being represented in the data that we have available to us. Um, and so what Khan and colleagues found is that we actually do not have a mandate at the national level to analyze our data according to race. And as a result, racialized people are, are invisible in our healthcare data and also in our research. And some of the questions that we need to pose are, are racialized Canadians healthier or less healthy than their white counterparts? And we don't really know for sure at the national scale because the way that racialized data is currently being collected is through individuals researchers who may have an interest in collecting this data. It's not collected in a systematic way in order for us to answer these questions in a rigorous way. Do racialized Canadians experience access to and receipt of healthcare differently from white Canadians? Again, we don't know for sure. Anecdotal evidence tells us yes. A few research studies tells us yes, but systematically do we know? No, we don't. But I would assume that if we collected data at the national level, we would see differences. Do risk factors for poor health conditions differ for racialized Canadians and white Canadians? And again, we can't answer this question definitively because we don't have the data, my guess would be yes. How do racialized groups compare with one another on health outcomes and measures? And my response would be the same, right? Uh, in order to, to know definitively, we do not have the data to tell us one way or the other, but my sense would be, yes, there are differences. And what we know is that inequitable health outcomes for Black, Indigenous, and people of color are rooted in policy, 
research, health promotion, and patient care. And a lot of these systems have been built by colonial settlers. And many of these systems currently that we currently have in place have yet to embark on the necessary processes of addressing the colonial racist and ableist structures that we see perpetuating inequities and in health outcomes for racialized population groups. So I'm just gonna take us back to um, the slide here. And so basically that was our evidence for the first point, right? We know that racial and, and, and ethnic inequities in health status across the healthcare system um, are present in the Canadian context. And that was the evidence that we just found. The evidence is not necessarily um, all inclusive because we don't have nationally represented data again, but definitely should be um, nudging us to ask some of these important questions in terms of the inequities that we're seeing and how we're a part of perpetuating these inequities. And even more important, how can we be part of the solutions? The next point on Hyman's slide was that racism directly impacts health primarily through the body's physiological stress response. There is evidence um, that tells us that people of color or racialized people experience stress differently than white people. Okay? And we need to um, come to the point where we're acknowledging the fact that genetic differences are not the cause of this. Genetic differences have very little to do with the racial differences that we see in the vast majority of chronic health conditions in our population in Canada. In, in Canada. And in fact, what has been proven by research is that adverse social conditions evoke a physiological response in the allostatic system as physiology seeks to maintain all systems in equilibrium. And the paid price for continued exposure to adverse social conditions is what we're calling allostatic load in the literature. And there's beginning to be a very wide body of, liter of, of research taken in this area. And how we explain this in very easy terms is allostatic load is the wear and tear on the body that occurs from chronic overactivity of the allostatic system, where in a prolonged fashion, um, this system in your body is looking to maintain e equilibrium. And it's doing this over and over and over and over. And because it's doing this over and over and over and over, it's increasing your allostatic load that will then predispose basically predispose you to being susceptible to different types of health conditions. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Now, the third point that I wanna talk about is the intersections and how it is we classify health outcomes um, largely depends on the intersections that we see in, in population groups, right? So for example, how do we define intersections? It's the multiple social identities at the macro level, including gender, race, different levels of ability, sexual orientation that intersect with the macro levels, excuse me, um, at the structural levels, including factors like racism, poverty, sexism, ageism, and ableism, and how these intersect to produce health disparities. And again, health disparities are those that are unfair, they're systematic, they're modifiable, and as a result, they're unjust. So an example of some of the intersections that we see are African, Caribbean, and Black women, right? So you see race here intersecting with sex are also vastly overrepresented in new HIV infections in comparison with their white counterparts. But we see from recent work that was put out by the Public Health Ag Agency of Canada is that they're actually not considered in research and interventions. And the question, the question I wanna ask is why? And the question that comes to my mind is who is sitting around the table when this research is being conducted and who is sitting around the table when interventions are being proposed? And do we have equitable representation of racialized people 
at tables where decisions like these are being made. Another example um, is how Black women and their intersections with income affect their unequal distribution of hypertension and diabetes, because we see that playing out differently. And we also see that playing out differently when we're comparing them to Black men. So these intersections of income, gender, and race are really important. And the third example here is a quote that I took from a qualitative study that was about access for Indigenous populations to Indigenous specific health services and social services. Um, and the quote was, the last two times that I went, it was really uncomfortable and sort of questioning whether or not I should even go. There's, the receptionist would be like, are you sure you're in the right place? And then the next time I went, she was like, are you native? And I was like, yeah. And it was like, oh, okay, sit down. You know, but it was just the question. I felt like, okay, maybe I shouldn't come here. That's a very powerful indication of how people are being treated differently. Um, and this was specifically for services um, preserved for Indigenous communities. And the last point that I would like for us to consider before we move into how we see inequities in COVID-19 playing out in terms of race is that institutional policies and practices act to perpetuate racial and eth ethnic health inequities and impede access to and quality of health care. Now, one thing that is becoming very, very clear in the literature that it's not race that's the determinant of health, it's racism that's the determinant of health. So the actual act of being treated differently because of your race is the social determinant of health and not just because you look differently. It's how you're treated because of how you look that is causing the inequity. And a lot of people fail to make this distinction. And our colleagues in research are identifying that it's actual racism itself that this, distinct, this dis distinction is rarely made. Um, another piece that is important and I've talked about previously, but I want to highlight again, is the lack of disaggregated data by race in the Canadian context is actually prohibitive to conducting research for racialized communities and for us to be able to identify evidence-based interventions that fit for our racialized communities in order to decrease inequities in health status that we're seeing. The third is current research, programming, and decision-making are not being conducted or led by our racialized researchers or community members. Just to give you an example, in the department that I work in, in the School of Nursing and Midwifery, um, we have five racialized faculty and we have 50 plus faculty altogether. And the question is, why is that? Are people not applying for positions or are racialized people actually applying for positions and are being blocked? Who's sitting at the table at the hiring committee? Do these people have biases that have not been addressed in order for them to make equitable decisions around who gets hired and who doesn't? These are all really important questions that must be asked. And we also need to recall that all of these structural issues um, are a result of the current assumption of race and health that are actually rooted in white supremacy, right? So whose notion of health is being foregrounded and whose is being backgrounded? Why are we um, making some aspects of health more predominant or more important or more deserving of conversation, attention and research than others? And the last point um, is that we know that racism, segregation, and inequality have been invisibly and per pervasively embedded in dominant cultures and social institutions for decades. And I'm just going to challenge, and, and there's no harm intended here, um, but the board members of the Community Health Nurses of Canada, I would love for you to reflect, to look at, you know, historically, who has sat on the board?
have you had an equitable representation of people of color on your board? Just some gentle nudging to make you think about compositions, right? And also committee compositions. What we're also finding is even when we have racialized faculty brought to the table who are keen to do research on inequity and health status and racism, um, they're often not given sufficient funding. And again, why is that? Who's sitting at the table who's, who are making these funding decisions? And there's this recent um, news article that I found from just about 10 days ago. Uh, this was published February 13th. Um, and basically saying that in, in order for you to keep your racialized faculty member, um, you have to make sure the funding is being allocated equitably. And if not, um, people are gonna leave, right? Their positions, if they're not being treated fairly or in the same way. And then what happens? Are we gonna see even more inequity perpetuated by the fact that even less researchers are being offered funding to move this important piece of work forward? Now, what we know, again, and this is, this is highlighted by literature, this is not just speculation. We know that there is no federal mandate to collect race-based data on COVID-19, okay? Um, and that's very similar to knowing that there's no mandate to provide desegregated data by race in order for us to answer the questions, are racialized people at a disadvantage in terms of their health status? There's no federal mandate. And I want you to think about that because it has implications for our nursing interventions. Um, and we do know too that even though there's no federal mandate, the city of Toronto has taken upon itself to release data according to race. And that's the only thing that I could find with respect to COVID-19 and racial inequities, okay? So what do we know? What do we know about COVID-19 and racialization. We know that COVID-19 has further exposed the ways in which social structures lead to inequities in health. This has also revealed to us um, that Canada has a poor infrastructure for, for tracking and, and addressing race-based inequities across health outcomes. And we also know that Canada is very slow to acknowledge the role that structural racism plays in our society and how that racism serves to generate and perpetuate inequities, okay? So a few, example, a few examples from recent literature again. Um, we know that racialized women are experiencing intersections of gender-based violence and systemic racism in the context of COVID-19 that is placing their wellness at disproportionate risk when compared to their white counterparts. We also know that more than one third of people employed as nurses aides and orderlies and, and people who serve patients are immigrants and women account for 86% of this group. We also know that Latin America, South Asian and black Canadians exceed 50% on economic vulnerability arising from COVID-19. And this has resulted in a crisis, right? Where 65 to 70% of people who are racialized have seen a decrease in their income Half of them have difficulty paying their bills on time, and 44 to 46% have difficulty paying their mortgage or rent on time. And so in short, what we've seen COVID-19 do is become a vector in deepening economic and social inequality or inequities that we see. Now take a look at this. This is data that I took from the City of Toronto's website about COVID-19 and how it is stratified according to race. And we see that Arab, Middle Eastern, or West Asian people are almost three times more likely to have COVID-19. We know that Black people are 2.6 times more likely to have COVID-19. And we also know that Southeast Asian people are almost two times more likely to have COVID-19. Those are pretty stark differences. And if that's not a wake up call, I don't know what is. And keep in mind that this is just data from the city of Toronto. It's not even national data. Now I recognize that city, the city of Toronto is more diverse, but at the same time, I don't think we would see, um, I don't think we would see race stratified much differently if we were to look at national data. It might actually be worse. So here's another, um, 
telling graph that I found from Mackenzie's uh, recent research. And you can see the different um, races separated out by color. And what we're seeing, um, again, this is, this is from Ontario, um, that Latino people have higher rates of COVID-19 incidents. And these are weekly case counts. So you can see how the differences are becoming more stark as we progress through the pandemic and the phases of the pandemic. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, we have rate ratios. Okay, so again, this is Toronto data in terms of who is actually hospitalized as a result of COVID-19. And we see a disparity here again, right? You see that Arab, Middle Eastern or West Asian, Black, Latin American, Southeast Asian and um, Indo-Caribbean are more likely to be the ones who we're seeing in hospital. And so the question again is why is that? This is from the city of Toronto. And of course, something that's come up of uh, significance during the pandemic is mental health, right? Again, we see a dis disproportionate number of racialized folks having um, decreased mental health well-being. Now, what I find really, really interesting is even though um, this particular medical officer of health, the chief medical officer of health, David William, um, stipulates that regardless of race, ethnic, or other background, people are equally important to us, but at the same time, he's refusing to collect race-based data. And so if, you know, had I been in that press conference, I probably would have said, where is your evidence, right? Or what evidence are you collecting to help you make these distinctions? And if you're not collecting the evidence, how are you demonstrating that racialized people are equally as important? And I would probably challenge him on this view, right? So since this came out, this was in 2021, um, Ontario, right? Different parts of Ontario have begun to start collecting race-based data, um, but no other provinces have. And so that's, that's a really significant question for us, right? What needs to be done? What needs to be done in terms of community health nursing standards of practice? What needs to be done at structural levels? And, and what is it that we can do, right? And so here are some points, some very tangible action points that I pulled from the literature um, and basically um, putting them here together on the slide for, for you. And these, these again are not complete, um, it's, a not, it's not a list of complete things that ought to happen in efforts to equalize or um, decrease inequities in health status. This is just a starting point. These are just some things that we need to start thinking about um, in terms of how do we establish a separate pot for money to study racism and health outcomes? Um, how, do we, how do we acknowledge that this is a concern that is very different from the health concerns that immigrant populations face, right? Because you can't equate racism and immigration status as one. They're not one, they're, they're not one in the same. They're two different things and they could be seen as an intersection. So that needs to be uh, teased out. Um, how do we advocate the acquisition of disaggregated data to make sure that the responses that we have at the policy and systems level and also at the community and individual level are appropriate? And then of course, um, you know, what do we do about this as community health nurses, right? And so the question I've highlighted here for you is how can you fill some of these gaps in your community health nursing practice? And what can you do from a social justice perspective? Um, and this is where I would start. And so this is what I've started paying attention to. And I've pulled this from the research um, as a way for me to do my piece in making sure I'm dismantling systems of oppression. Um, paying attention to who is marginalized in our classrooms, clinics, research and, com and communities and trying to identify how it is they're marginalized. How do we challenge everyday racism, right? So for example, Sherman Cooper say, um, you know, if you've got a Filipino medical student that's mistaken for an orderly or the brown skinned junior resident is asked repeatedly where she is from and where she learned to speak English so well, how do we interject when we see things like this happening? And what do we do to, to dismantle systems of oppression? How do we do our part at the individual level and at the same time contribute to and advocate for changes that need to happen at the systemic 
and structural levels. Okay. Another, um, another challenge I have for you is where can you break the cycle of oppression in your community health nursing practice? What, it, what can you do in your community health nursing practice to make sure you're identifying or pointing out when someone is coming from biased information or somebody is working from a stereotype or you see prejudice playing out or you see overt acts of discrimination and oppression, how, how can you break that cycle? What can you do? And just a reminder here too, that health equity is part of your standard of practice. And when I was on um, the expert advisory group working to revise the standards of practice, um, you know, we, need to, we needed to fight really hard to make sure we got this indicator in, right? And these are how it is we're measuring your health equity work. What do you do when your employer um, is creating systemic barriers as a community health nurse? How do you point this out? And then how do you then align this with your standards of practice? So I'm just gonna read this out because I think it's really powerful and it took us a long time to wordsmith this. Um, the community health nurse understands historical injustices, inequitable power relations, institutionalized and interpersonal racism and their impacts on health and healthcare and provides culturally safe care. So your response to any inequity that you're seeing is actually classified as you providing culturally safe care or working towards providing culturally safe care. And just as a reminder, because I know we're running out of time here, um, equitable rights for others does not mean less rights for you if you don't come from a racialized uh, identity or community. It's not pie. Just because other people have rights um, that will feed to them uh, leading to decreases in inequity, it doesn't mean that you are gonna see more inequity in your status. And just a reminder for you, um, I found this post and I thought it was really quite nice for us to, to end this um, conversation today. And it's how Morgan Harper Nichols defines empathy or embodies empathy rather. Um, and I'm gonna read that to you. Let me hold the door for you. I may never have walked in your shoes, but I can see your souls are worn and your strength is torn under the weight of a story I've never lived before. So let me hold the door for you. After all you've walked through, it's the least I can do. And so I challenge you um, to identify what doors you can hold open for racialized people as you work with them in your community health nursing practice. Um, and I'd like to end there, but for any of you who would like more information, I've provided um, you know, an extensive li list of resources here in the references. Um, I would encourage all of you to you know, pick a few articles and read through them because even as a racialized person, they were really eye-opening for me. Um, and I just wanted to leave you with, with that. Um, thank you so much for taking the time um, to listen to me today. And um, I'm gonna pass it over to, to Donna to see if there are any questions. Thank you, Elia, that was excellent. Um, I could feel the content in my gut. <laughs> and uh, I suspect when I reviewed the chat that other nurses were feeling that same way. Um, just one of the, the questions or comments uh, first to come out was people were surprised by the placing of Canada at the bottom. I think that was around the societal level construct. And so I, I think what we were thinking is how can we improve that? And these last few slides, I think will help with that. Would there be anything else or a first place to start? You've made some suggestions for our board recruitment too at CHNC, but um, any, any thoughts on a, a, a major priority? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's important for us to normalize these types of conversations. Um, a lot of the time I find, especially in my place of work, that people are hesitant to talk about race and racism generally, um, you know, let alone how this impacts people's health status. Um, I think we need to start normalizing the conversation and, and, and knowing that we're all learning this process together, right? Just because I'm a racialized person and take an interest specifically in race and health outcomes doesn't mean I'm the expert. Um, I'm definitely open to conversation and bouncing ideas off of and coming from a place of non-judgment. 
But I think that definitely starts with conversation and how do we make safe places to talk about this? Great. Um, this was, it, it was excellent, excellent information. I took notes and I want to learn more. I hope you're putting in an abstract for our conference so we can continue to learn and move forward. I'm just conscious of the time. It's 102 and I suspect that community health nurses across Canada from many provinces and territories need to get back to um, other parts of their work. So um, it's it's been an honor and privilege to learn from you today and to hear your insight and your honesty, sharing your personal stories and those of, of um, your colleagues and the research that you have conducted to put this information uh, together for us. I really want to thank you for that, Alia. And um, I can't wait to hear more from you. I think we will close there and um, turn off the tape. A reminder, if people have an abstract in mind, please submit it. You don't have to be a researcher. We want to hear from practitioners, uh, people in the, in the field, people in policy as well. So March 4th is the deadline. And I hope people will sign up for the CHNC conference, which is June 8th to the 10th, 2022. And it will be a virtual format and sessions will also be taped um, for people to um, be able to have the full learning experience. So um, Anthony, thank you for all your tech and with the registration process, I'm um, uh, thankful for your work um, to bring this together today. Thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of the day and evening for some of you in Atlantic uh, Canada. Bye for now. Thank you everybody, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.